All right, so it's 10 o'clock, so I'll start the boring intro stuff while people are still trickling into the room. Uh, my name is Chris Hostetter, or Haas. Uh, I, uh, I work for Lucidworks. I work on solar full time. Um, and I've been working on solar for, I don't know, 10 years, however fucking old it is at this point. Um, today's talk is uh, Hidden Gems of Apache Solar. Uh, it's very vague on purpose because I like to look at the agenda for all of Revolution um, once it's announced and make sure that I don't cover anything that's already being covered in any other talks. So hopefully you won't see anything here today that you'll see in any other talk uh, and I won't waste any time on features that you're going to go learn about from people who know way more about them than me. This is really the, uh, this is the opening intro sampler. Uh, the goal here is to show you things that uh, you might not be aware of, not because they're new. Um, I'm not gonna show you anything cutting edge. Everything we're gonna talk about today is in Solar 5. Uh, so even if you're not on 6, you should be able to use everything you see today. Um, but it's things that uh, not a lot, of either people don't know about or people don't really uh, grasp enough to appreciate all the ways they can be used or they may have heard about it but not really understand what the point is, like why would I care about that feature. Um, so this is just, uh, this is gonna be like a machine gun approach. I'm just gonna like show you something, talk about it, show you something, talk about it. Uh, you're gonna think, wow, that was a really awkward transition. Like, what did those two things have to do with each other? Absolutely fucking lutely nothing. Most of these things have nothing to do with each other. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk about movies. Uh, that's gonna be our consistent example throughout the talk because I'm gonna be uh, jumping all over the place on features, so I figure my, uh, my data set examples should at least be consistent. So let's jump in. So we're gonna start with talking about some query parsers. Yay, okay, so query parsers. Uh, there's three query parsers up on the board that are the three query parsers almost everybody has heard of, hopefully. Um, this is the audience participation part of the talk. Who here has used the Lucene query parser? Raise your fucking hands. Who here will never raise their hand no matter what I say? Who here has ever done a solar query? Okay. Anybody who just raised their hand and didn't raise their hand the first time is probably lying. Um, okay, so the Lucene query parser, the canonical syntax, if you've ever used Solar, you've almost certainly used the Lucene parser whether you knew it or not. Okay, Dismax. Who's used Dismax? Who's used Dismax on purpose? <laughs> okay, uh, Dismax, uh, the, where the Lucene query parser has just been around even before Solar, and it was just sort of the first default, like before anybody even thought about the fact that maybe there should be more than one, or maybe there should be multiple syntaxes. It's what Lucene supported, it's what Solar supported. Dismax was really the first attempt at saying, maybe we should have more parsers. Uh, and Dismax tried to simplify things, get to the point where you would never get a syntax error. Um, it's my fault, and I apologize. Uh, Blame it on me. Um, it's terrible, I, I, but it, it solves its problem pretty well. Um, EDISMAX is a sort of hybrid that came along later where people said, you know what I really like? I really like all the pain of the Lucene parser, but I wish it had all of the annoying quirks of the DISMAX parser. Is there any way we can make the worst of both worlds? Um, and that's where EDISMAX came along. It, it's very powerful. It lets you do all of the query syntax of the Lucene parser but it gives you the sort of uh, the interesting uh, disjunction query effects of the dismax parser. Uh, who here actually knows what I mean when I say a disjunction query? All right. Mm. All right, I'm mentally adjusting the way this talk's gonna go. Um, basically, a disjunction query is the ability to say, look, I've got some input and I want to search for it across many fields, but not like a, an and query or an or query. I actually want the scores to be based on whichever field scores the best. Um, that's, that's where this sort of disjunction max concept comes from. A disjunction query is basically just an or query. A disjunction max query, which is what dismax stands for, fun trivia, uh, that means, so of these two options, which one scores the best? Ignore the other one. Um, EDISMAX kind of takes that to the next level and says we're still gonna do that. We're still gonna let you query for the same thing against many fields and find the max, but if you happen to use the Lucene syntax on top of that, we're gonna try and make it play nice with all of those things, all right? If you're not familiar with all of these three parsers, I highly recommend you go check out the Solar User Guide. There's some pretty good examples, or the Solar Reference Guide, as it's called, because we were stupid and we should have called it the User Guide. Um, so there's some pretty good examples there. These are really the three sort of canonical ones. Um, like, like I say, most people have used these. If you haven't, you really should. The, the, you know, here's an example of the scene syntax that I'm talking about, basically saying, uh, we have an actor field, we're gonna look for Ben Affleck in that field. We have a keywords field, we're gonna look for Boston. Um, 
This def type parameter up here is a terrible name for the default type of query that we're parsing. That basically, you know, you don't need that line there because by default it's going to use Lucene. But this is an example of that syntax. If you uh, if you fuck up and you forget this quote here, so you don't close your quote characters, uh, you're going to get a syntax error. The world ends. The dismax parser it, it it builds these like I said these disjunction queries. What the dismax parser tries to do is eliminate the special syntax. We don't have to say we're searching the actor field or the keywords field. We put that in other parameters. We say in someplace else, we want to search title, actor, writer, director, keywords. And the dismax says, well, Ben Affleck appears in the actor field. It doesn't appear in the title field because there's no movies named after Ben Affleck, thank God. Um, so because of that, it'll try both of them. And whichever one it actually gets something, that's what contributes to the score. The other one doesn't. So we, we've moved. We've moved away from syntax and into configuration, essentially. EDISMAX says, why not both? If one is good and two is better, why not two plus one? So with EDISMAX, you start being able to say, I want to put some specific field names in my query string. But if I don't, then uh, this Boston example here will still be searched against all of these fields. Um, EDISMAX also sort of adds, uh, I, didn't, I didn't talk about in DISMAX this PF parameter. It's basically a way of saying, you know, QF means query fields. Uh, find my query words in these fields. PF is phrase fields. If my entire phrase, if my entire query appears as a phrase in any one of these fields, make the score higher. That's what, that's what the PF parameter means in DISMAX. In EDISMAX, we actually have PF2, because if one is good, two is better. PF2 is actually about doing uh, what's called shingles. Uh, it's basically saying if any two words in sequence appear in one of these fields, treat that better. Um, so that's a, that's a sort of added feature of EDISMAX that surprisingly not many people know about, even though it's, in my opinion, one of the best reasons to use EDISMAX, is because it really helps you find, um, you know, in this example, which is terrible, and I don't know why I put it on the slide now that I think about it, um, we've already said we're only looking for Ben Affleck in the actor field. But if we had just said Ben Affleck, Boston, we want movies about Ben Affleck in Boston, uh, the PF2 parameter would say, well, Ben and Affleck, in sequence, appear in this actor field. That's two in a row, boom. Let's, let's boost this, this movie, town or whatever. Uh, Affleck, Boston, those two words in sequence, they don't appear anywhere, so ignore it. But it will try all those permutations, right? That's what the PF2 parameter comes in. So it's a nice little feature of eDismax that people don't really know about, but they ought to. Another nice little feature about eDismax is, uh, I, honestly, I don't even think it has a fucking name, which is really obnoxious, but uh, I call it field aliasing. Basically, it lets us say, you know what, instead of, in this example, we remember we had actor Ben Affleck. Actor is a real field in our index, supposedly. Um, what field aliasing lets us do is it lets us say, look, let's pretend there's a person field. It's not real. I'm just going to define it on the fly with this parameter, f.person.qf. If somebody uses person in their query string, then I want you to do a disjunction max just for that part over the actor, writer, director fields. So it lets us sort of create this abstract concept at query time. What if there was a person field? Uh, and in reality, that's a disjunction over the actor, writer, director field. And then people can use that in their query string. So even if our index just had actor, writer, director, if someone says, I want a movie where Ben Affleck is involved in any way because I'm a masochist, um, we could do f.person.qf and we could find all of those. Um, so again, another interesting feature, a lot of people use eDismax, but they don't drill in and sort of see some of these weird quirks. Um, this is one of them that I think is, you know, this is, this is why I go use eDismax uh, when I feel like hurting myself. Um, another one is user fields. This is, this is super awesome and I wish more people would take advantage of it. Because eDismax lets you have that whole syntax, because it lets you search for things in particular fields or search for phrases or use the Boolean syntax of the Lucene parser, it really exposes a lot of the internals that you don't necessarily want to expose. Um, and one of those, like I say, is that field colon syntax, right? Being able to say search for something only in a certain field. Um, if you look at this top line here, if we're searching, uh, Matt Damon did a movie called Geronimo, an American legend. Anybody seen it? Yeah, I didn't think so. Um, but if somebody tried to search for Matt Damon, Geronimo, an American legend, and you forget to put a space after that colon, um, Solar and EDISMAX by default, they're going to say, well, we really fucking have to find the word an, and it really better be in the field Geronimo. Um, and I'm 
pretty sure most indexes don't have a field named Geronimo. If your field index has a field named Geronimo, I'd love to talk to you because <laughs> um, that is just a very interesting use case. And I would really love to know why you have a field named Geronimo in your index. But most people don't have that. And most of the time, this query would match nothing or would throw an error or would do something stupid. And you don't want that. Um, where the UF parameter or user fields, we're great with names in solar, uh, where that field really comes in handy is it lets you say, these are the field names that a user is allowed to put in their query string when they do an edismax query. And so in this example here, I've said the only fields that I'm gonna look for in my query string are person and title. That's it. If someone goes to my t search box and they type a bunch of keywords, great, search for them. And again, we still have our, our QF parameter here and our PF parameter here. That's what we're gonna search for by default. But if they happen to use person or title in the query string, that's okay. Then we'll search specifically in those fields. And you'll notice we're still using our virtual uh, field name person here. That's not something in our index. That's something we've defined as a field alias. That's also okay for our user field parameter. So um, that's edismax. That's some cool features of edismax that I think people should check out. But there's a lot of other parsers, right? There's a, at least two dozen by my count uh, other parsers that exist in solar that not a lot of people know about or even kind of realize are there. Um, the ones kind of down here-ish, they all relate to document relations and interconnectedness between documents, either explicitly in the block join case or kind of abstractly at query time. Um, everything in that upper left section here is about different syntaxes, similar to the way Lucene has a syntax and edismax kind of builds on that syntax. That column's all about like totally different syntaxes. Um, the XML parser literally takes in an XML data structure which describes your query. Um, this middle, like, upper section here, this is all about saying fuck syntax. We shouldn't have any syntax. No special characters. No, no special semantic or syntactic meaning. My input is what I'm searching for. Um, down here, we have things that are very related to filtering. Uh, one's related to spatial. One's related to uh, uh, collapsing things or, or doing filtering on numeric values. Uh, up there, we get things that are designed to build queries which wrap other queries and modify them in certain ways. Um, there's a lot of shit to play with, and there's a lot of parsers to mess around with. Um, and if everything on this slide is new to you, there's a whole fucking world that you have not seen yet that you should check out, because a lot of the pain people fight with in parser syntax, and in like, ah, oh, I have this query I want to express, and it's such a pain in the ass. Well, that's because the Lucene parser is it's good, and it's very featured, but it's not the end all be all. Um, some of these parsers might be more useful to you. Um, the ones in green in particular, I don't know how easy it is to see, uh, but the ones kind of bolded in green are ones that I personally feel like I have yet to see a use case of solar, or a, not a single use case. I've yet to see an installation of solar where there wasn't some value in those parsers for the people who built that index. Um, so I would definitely recommend everybody go check out Boost, FRANGE, Term and Terms, Field, and Simple. Those are almost always useful to people. Other parsers on here are useful, don't get me wrong. But I've yet to meet someone who's like, this is my use case of solar, and one of those green ones wasn't helpful to them. Okay? So uh, we're going to just look at a, some examples of a few of these. Um, the field parser, um, the field parser is really all about saying, I want to search one field, I want to search it for what my user gave me, and I don't give a fuck about syntax. I don't, I don't care about and, I don't care about or. If I search for the movie title Hell or High Water, I am not trying to find the movie Hell or the movie High Water. I'm trying to find a movie whose name is Hell or High Water. I want to search the title field, done. That's it. Doesn't matter what else is there. Doesn't matter what punctuation I've got. Doesn't matter that there might be a parenthesis in the movie name. I want to search that in the field. This will use whatever the analyzer is for the title field. It'll parse it, it'll build the query, it'll search for it. Okay? Um, the terms parser and the term parser, two different examples here, plural terms, singular term, these guys are really handy for filtering, particularly when you deal with facets. Um, when you are, are faceting and you're getting terms back with counts, facet constraints, um, those are the indexed terms. They've already been parsed, they've already been normalized, lowercase, what have you. Um, these parsers help you search for things that match those terms exactly without doing additional analysis, without doing initial parsing. So if we look at the bottom, actually, yeah, let's look at the bottom example. This is the terms parser. Similar to field, it takes in a field name. 
its only special syntax is a comma. So it will find you any document that matches any of the terms. That's why it's called the terms parser. Again, did I mention we're good with naming? Who thinks we're good with naming? Come on. Just me? That's what I thought. Um, any term in that list. And the comma is configurable. If, if comma means something in your terms, you can always change this. You can add a uh, separator parameter. So you could do it space. You could do it pipe. You could do whatever you wanted. But anything that matches those, it'll match. And that's great for when you want to do faceting and you want to do multi-select, right? You want to find all the movies in any of these genres as they check the boxes. The term parser is sort of the flip version. Uh, it, it, it doesn't have any syntax. It doesn't even support the comma. It's just saying, here is one term in one field. What documents match it? And again, with multiple FQ parameters, you could, this is really helpful for faceting. All right. So I mentioned we're jumping around, right? It's completely unrelated. More like this parser. Um, the more like this parser, talk about no syntax. Uh, it takes a document ID. That's it. No search terms. You have to actually know the document ID. But what it does with that document ID, in this case, Goodwill Hunting 1997, that's my unique key for that movie, let's say. Um, we're going to find that document, and what the more like this parser is going to do is it's going to go get that document, it's going to go look at the query fields that I've specified, it's going to pull out all of the terms, and it's going to look for the interesting ones. Uh, the definition of interesting is vague and it makes up its own talk, and Antrim's sitting right there, and you can ask him all about it because he wrote it. Um, but once it finds the interesting terms in those fields, then it's going to go find, wait for it, more like this. So it'll look and see what keywords does this document have, what, uh, what terms pop up in the director field, and it will go try to find other documents that have similar values in those fields. And you'll see here I've got a, a max DF parameter. Um, there's a bunch of parameters that it takes, max DF, min DF, max TF, I think. There's a bunch of options for sort of tuning and tweaking uh, what terms you want it to pull out how you want to restrict what options it are to adjust and tune it, but it's all ultimately about saying, you know, uh, I've got a, you know, so you could have like a widget on your movie site. Once somebody's looking at a page about a movie, you could kind of recommend them other things based purely on term stacks, right? That's what that guy's for. The, uh, the boost parser, um, this is a personal favorite of mine. <laughs> um, the boost parser is really all about saying, I've got a query, which I built somehow, Lucene parser, EDIS max, doesn't matter, field parser. Um, it's going to match some set of documents, and it's going to give them a score. But I know something more about those documents than what's just expressed in the score of this query that I'm wrapping, and that's based on some numeric values. Um, in this example, I know the popularity of a movie, and I know its rating. Uh, numeric rating, not like, not like an R rating, but like maybe a five-star rating. Um, and maybe popularity is how many people actually watched it. You know, a movie might have been watched by millions of people and they all, you know, jiggle, giggly or something. They all gave it a one-star rating. Um, I can take those numeric values and I can compute kind of an abstract numeric ranking or weighting for that movie. Um, and what the boost parser lets me do is take that numeric rating and multiply it by my score. So I, I'm still taking advantage of classic IR concepts of how to score documents based on terms but I'm augmenting it with, um, what's the word I'm looking for, domain knowledge. I'm augmenting it with numerical information that I have that the ranking formula might not take into account, right? Uh, the boost parser is, is really handy for that. And, and for people who like math, yeah, just bask in the glory of that equation. I don't know. Um, some people really like math, and they're like, why don't you put the equation up in a way that I can read it? I'm like, all right, if you could read that, have fun. Um, so we've talked about some of these other parsers. We've talked about like cool things you can do with other parsers. Um, but don't, don't be fooled. Don't think that that means that the Lucene parser is you know, no good and it's stagnant. Um, there's a lot of things about the Lucene parser that people don't realize that it does. Right? Let's, um, let's look at this example for a second. Let's imagine that you're searching for movies uh, that Matt Damon was an actor in. Um, and you're filtering by awards that you, know, you want something that's won an Oscar and a Golden Globe. I think there's one. Maybe two. Anyway, um, you've got this query, and this works okay. Um, it works really well, but uh, you know your boss at your movie company says, you know what, we don't want to filter by awards anymore. We just want them at the top, right? We want all the movies that Matt Damon's been in, but if it's won an Oscar and a Golden Globe, we want it at the very top of the list. We want it to score the highest. 
So your first inclination might be to say, okay, that, that, that's easy. I'm going to do this. So now you've said if it's won an Oscar or a Golden Globe, boom, big, big score increase. So this works, and this is good. Um, what you've lost here is you've lost the filter cache, right? When you were filtering, each one of these filter queries was getting cached independently and reused on every query, right? You weren't having to recompute who were the list of all the Golden Globe winners every time. Now you're doing this every time. And maybe you're like, well, I really, I'm going to filter on this later. I'm faceting on this. I really, I want to cache this. I don't, there's no score coming out of these individual clauses, right? I don't care what the score is. It's going to be the same. Either it has it or it doesn't, right? It's basically Boolean logic to me. I, d I don't need a score value there. I don't care how much the score value contributes. I really, I want this to be a filter, but I want to use it in this sort of non-trivial way. Um, Lucene lets you do that. Or I'm sorry, the Lucene parser lets you do that. Again, terrible with names. Basically, if you use this filter syntax, filter, open paren, wrap a query, you can put any query in there you want, and it actually tells Solar, go treat this as a filter. Put it in the filter cache, just like with the FQ parameter, but I, it lets you embed it in another query. Right? So within the Lucene syntax as a whole, we're embedding an arbitrary query. In this case, they have to be just simple field queries, but they can be anything you want. And it will compute that query, it'll ignore the score, cache it as a filter, and let you reuse it over and over again, right? So now we kind of have the best of both worlds. We're getting those filters, we're getting those sets of documents cached so we can easily reuse that. Uh, no matter what I query for, as long as I refer to this filter again and again and again, that set is still cached in my filter cache and reused, it's not being recomputed. The next guy who comes along and does a search for Ben Affleck or Casey Affleck or any of the fucking Afflecks, uh, they're all gonna reuse that same filter. Um, but it lets me put it in the Lucene syntax the way I want, right? Um, the other neat trick of the Lucene parser that not a lot of people know about is that I can embed any query inside the Lucene parser, any parser syntax I want. Um, so this example is a little weird to read, but basically, you know, we're still using our filter trick from before, but if you notice that second line there, what we've done is we've said, we're gonna build a Lucene query where the first clause is mandatory, that's the plus, and that first mandatory clause is whatever is generated by the edismax parser. Who here, made, who here did that make sense for? Who here did my sentence asking if that made sense for make sense for? Because I just realized that was a terrible way of phrasing that. Okay, who doesn't understand what they're looking at right now? I believe you, and I, I applaud you, sir, for your bravery, because most people are lying. Okay. So I'm gonna walk through this again real fast, right? So the Q parameter is your main query. In this case, I've, I've made my main query be a Lucene query syntax, right? So I've opened the parentheses to start a Boolean query, right? That's, uh, that's that guy. Never felt short in my life until now. Um, so that open parentheses is starting a Boolean query in the Lucene syntax. And then that plus is saying, I've got this next clause is gonna be mandatory. And what that clause is, we're gonna move on for a second, right? But what matters is that first clause is mandatory and then it's all in green. There are some other clauses, which are down here, which are not mandatory, and they're also in the Lucene syntax. They're creating those filters that we just talked about, okay? So we've got a query, it's Boolean, it's got one mandatory clause and then an optional clause. Now we go back and we think about the mandatory clause, okay? We, we think about the stuff in green. Instead of having to express it in the Lucene syntax, I don't know why I keep burping today, I'm sorry. Uh, instead of having to express it in Lucene syntax, we're actually embedding a query string in another syntax directly inside of it. And these curly braces are what tell the, uh, the Lucene parser, hey, stop for a minute. We're gonna now use the edismax parser and uh, this V parameter, this is the local parameter syntax. I should have asked this earlier. Who here is familiar with local parameters and that syntax? Ah, see, I, sh I glossed over something, I'm sorry. Um, let, me, let me just go back real fast. Let me find a good, right. Might as well start here. This is a good enough one. Okay. Forget everything I just told you. Well, not forget it, because I want you to remember it again in a minute, but we're, 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 we're simplifying our example. Um, one of the things you can do in Solar is called local parameters. Uh, when you're having a query string and it's being parsed, uh, if it starts with these curly braces, curly brace bang, that's telling us which parser we're gonna use. So in this example, curly brace bang boost, we're saying we're gonna use the boost parser here. 
Everything until the next curly brace is what's called a local parameter. It's basically just like if you'd put a parameter in your request, but you're allowed to embed it directly in the query string. So we're saying we're going to use the boost parser, and we're going to pass it two parameters, b and v. b is a parameter that's special to the boost parser. It tells us what function we want to use. And v tells us the value of the string. It's just like you know, what would come after the curly braces, but it lets us point to another variable. So we're saying that the boost function comes from a func parameter, which is that last line. And the value that we're going to wrap around comes from the qq parameter. There's nothing special about those parameter names. They're just variables that I used in local parameters, right? So with that, with that foolish on my part to gloss over explanation, uh, we go back to this example where we have embedded inside of our Lucene query another query string which says go use the edismax parser and give it the value of whatever's in the qq parameter, right? So we're wrapping the edismax query in a more complex Lucene query, which can contain whatever syntax we want. Uh, and then, like I say, same filters as before, and here's the, uh, here's the parameters we're using to configure edismax. Does that make sense, folks? Now that I went back, okay, yeah. Sorry, I get a little ahead of myself. And then I go back, and then I get a little behind myself. 1026, hmm. All right. So this is not a feature of the Lucene parser. Um, this is a feature of Solar that, again, people We've had it since, I think, Solar 5, but it kind of snuck under the radar. Um, when, we, when we talked about that previous example and we talked about local parameters, I mentioned you know, things like this $QQ is a way of dereferencing a variable and saying, go find this other parameter. Um, that syntax has been around for years, right? The, the local parameter syntax, the V equals dollar something. Um, you've always been able to do that, but it always had to be the whole value, right? You always had to say, look, I, I want to go dereference a variable, but it's the entire parameter value. What, uh, what a lot of people don't know is there's this slightly different variable syntax. I'm trying not to trip. <laughs> um, what this is saying is, you know, it's the same thing. It's still saying there's going to be a people parameter over here, and I want to go dereference it and find that. But this is, can be used in any string, right? So any parameter, any place you have a string value, you can go embed in it this variable syntax, which is uh, you know dollar curly brace, right? So it's similar to ant variables and a couple other languages use the syntax, but it lets you sort of inline a parameter. So whereas this older syntax that I thought more people were familiar with, um, that has to be the entire parameter value. This one we can embed in the middle of a larger string. So here you see us in both the QF string and the PF2 string. Those are larger string parameters that contain other things, sometimes before and after, sometimes just before but we can go and embed that entire people parameter inside of it. We can also, uh, again, borrowing syntax from smarter people, we can also embed defaults. So if you don't specify a people parameter, this says if this, vi if this, if this parameter doesn't exist, the default value should be actor, right? And if you don't have a default, it's just empty string. So again, another little syntax that helps kind of simplify your queries that not a lot of people know about, but is very powerful, it's a, you know, kind of a good way to reuse other pieces of information. Um, yeah, so something you don't, may not have known about. Okay, so that transitions us to request parameters, which I didn't have a good movie pun for. Or, oh wait, I did have a good movie pun for it. The good, the okay, and the ugly. Um, yeah, that was a pretty ugly pun. So let's, uh, let's rethink this example. Um, let's relook at it again. Let's bask in its glory. Uh, we, this is the type of query maybe we've settled on and we say, you know what? This is it. This is the good way we want to do our movie search, right? Whatever, whatever our user gives us, we're going to put that in the QQ parameter. And all these other things, we want to be consistent. Um, this is how we would think about our query. But what a lot of people sort of complain about is that this is what it looks like over the wire. Um, and they say, oh, but this is really hard to read. And it's really hard to write. To which I say, why would you ever read or write this? Like, that's, that's what HTTP APIs are for, right? You should be using a client library where you can give it, you know, good things and it does all the escaping for you. Um, but even if you do that, this is still an obnoxious amount of information to go over the wire. It's obnoxious that your client code, and you might have, you know, many different clients, it's obnoxious that all of them have to know about QF and PF and people and things like that. You know, ideally, Ideally, what you want is you want your clients to just be able to do things like this. 
You want your client to be able to say, look, I'm searching for movies, and I want to find it by people, and here's my query string. Um, or maybe, you know, we had that people parameter, actors, writers, directors. Maybe you want them to be able to sort of specify what type of person they're looking for, just a director, right? You want a nice, simple, clean query API that abstracts away some of those details so all of your clients don't need to know about it. This is something you've been able to do for a long time. Um, I'm not going to go into this example too much in depth, but this was the okay way that Solar supported since like 1.2 maybe, um, which allowed you to sort of default some of these parameters directly into your config file. Um, after that was this vastly improved syntax that I guarantee you most people can't immediately spot what's different between this slide and the last slide, but I assure you it was, it was an improvement. Um, and then we've moved on. So now what, what, we, you know, what I would recommend to people is basically you can create a request handler in your config file called you know, find by person, whatever you want to call it. Um, and you can define sets of parameters that you want to reuse. Um, so in this case, I've sort of separated my logic out and I've said there's the concept of boosting by awards and then there's the concept of query defaults, things I want on every query. And then I can use the config API, which is a runtime API you can hit with curl or whatever to say what those parameters are. So I can say my query defaults are that the definition of people is actor, writer, or director. And I can say that boost awards is an invariant concept, meaning it has to be applied, they can't overwrite it, and this is what I want that query to be. And I can change this, right? As long as I've got this definition in my configuration file, then at query time, at runtime, I can be like, you know what? I kind of want to tweak the definition of boosting awards. I want to change this. So I can hit this API at runtime while I've got my server up, while, while queries are coming in, and I can redefine what this means without my clients ever having to know about it. This is really the current sort of best practice for kind of having those simplified query URLs so that your clients don't have to know about your implementation details. You can use the config API, whoops, you can use the config API to sort of define what you want, right? And then these are all applied, your, your query structure that you want, your defaults, these are all applied whenever people hit that request handler, okay? I see a lot of glazed looks, and, and I'll be honest, I kind of expected that. When these slides go online, there's going to be links in the reference to the reference guide for each one of these slides in the speaker notes. Um, the, the main takeaway I want you to get is that this is possible, right? It is possible for you to have extremely simple query strings, extremely simple requests, where your client doesn't have to know what they're searching, what the details are, what they're searching. They just have to know their query string and whatever options you want to tell them about, and then you through the config API can define what that means. Okay? Is that? All right, now we got people nodding. That's what I like to see. All right, not a lot of time. Personalized scoring, um, this is a vague kind of confusing concept. There's a bunch of talks over the next two days about adjusting relevancy, tuning relevancy. Um, but what I mean by personalized scoring is I really, it goes back to the, the, the example I sort of mentioned with the boost parser and kind of adjusting and tweaking scores based on domain knowledge, things that don't really fit into relevancy functions the way you normally think about it. Um, I, I, I recommend people go check out these talks, but from what I understand, these talks are really gonna be about the relevancy function, right? The terms and what users search for. They're not necessarily about the domain expertise or the no user knowledge about what your user in particular is looking for. Um, and what I kind of, like the two minute you know, gem that I wanna point out is that if you have some user knowledge, if you know things about your users, if you aggregate information uh, about your user base as a whole or about individual users and their preferences, um, that information can be very handy and that information can be very usable in real time search result queries, right? So, um, you know, the, the, there's two levels, right? Level number one, if you know what movies your user base as a whole, let's just say you're Netflix, Right, if you know in general what movies Netflix users like and what movies they've watched, then you can compute an aggregate ranking. You can say this is the most popular movie on our service, the second most popular, the 10th most popular, and that aggregate ranking can be used to influence the scores for all of your movies. That's level one, right? That's, that's a good kind of intermediate goal for solar users. And that, that fits back into that example I mentioned before about the boost parser, okay? But you can actually take that to another level by saying if you know which categories of movies individual users like, right? When you're doing your weekly, uh, your weekly you know, Hadoop job to crunch all that data, if you track on a per user basis, 
their preferences, what genres they're interested in, then you put that in some sort of key value store, maybe even other solar collection, then you can bias an individual user search results towards the genres they like, right? Um, if you think about this simple example, this goes back to what I was talking about before. This is, this is the idea of you've computed a general popularity for movies, which is great, but no matter what user comes to your site, you're always gonna recommend the same movies. Even if you know that this guy really likes action movies, but this guy really likes dramas, right? You're still gonna give them the same results. But if you take that information that you have about those two people, you can sort of generate this list of genre preferences, right? You can normalize that across your user base, and then you can factor that into the popularity equation. Again, math nerds, enjoy, I'm moving on. This is what it would actually look like. This is a real example from a guy named uh, Amit. He was doing, it wasn't movies, he was doing, uh, I think it was like ticket sales for like concerts. Um, but basically, he was offline computing for every user, what are your top two genres, right? Or not top two, not what were your favorites, but where were you most, uh, ugh, can't talk. Where were you statistically the most interesting, right? So in this example, this guy was, you know, he was very outside the norm for action movies, right? He was, you know, he ranked 1.4, whereas most people are a one. And on kids' movies, psh, he hated them. He never watched them. Compared to even the average person, he never watched kids' movies, and when he did, he downvoted them, right? So these are the two values that were the most statistically abnormal for him, for genres. And then we plug those into power functions, right? When we search for movies, we say, okay, well, there's the general popularity of the movie, how, how widely liked is it in general, but then multiply that by a power function where we look at his opinions about the genres of those movies, and that helps us heavily weight those scores, right? It's not a lot of information to track on a per user basis. It's not a lot of data to have to go crunch out of the log, right? Maybe there's 20 genres, 30 genres, 100 genres. So for each user, you're just having to track their numerical ranking for those genres. But then you can plug them back in, okay? So I'm unfortunately out of time, um, but we do have time for some questions, and then there's another session in like 10 minutes. So quick return around on the room, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. The um, the curly brace syntax for variables, uh, that can be any string context. So any place where you specify a string, you can put this curly brace, in, this dollar curly brace, right? So it could be it could be in here, it could be in the query string itself, it could be anywhere you want. Uh, so the way the config API works, um, this gets into implementation detail. You shouldn't necessarily assume it too much, but there's actually a, uh, a JSON data file that contains what the config parameter, what the runtime specified config parameters are. Uh, it, it doesn't actually get written into Solar Config XML, but it is. If you're in cloud, it is in Zookeeper. If you're in single node, it does get written on disk, um, and it is loaded by Solar and treated as runtime. Basically, uh, especially in like a cloud, if you redefine this stuff then when the core is reloaded, after you hit this API, it does a broadcast and, you know, in sequence kind of reloads the cores and all the replicas. It's, you know, then at, at uh, it's, uh, from your plugin perspective, if you had a custom plugin, it gets reinitialized with those init parameters, yeah. What, which parser? Oh, oh, and well, so that's, I mean, that kind of depends on the specifics, right? So in an example like, oh yeah, sure. Sorry, the question was about how the parser choices and how using the more interesting parsers affects performance, right? Yeah, so um, some of the parsers are more performant because they don't do scoring, for example, right? So, uh, you know, for example, the terms parser, uh, if I go back here, right? This guy is a little more performant than the, um, than the regular Lucene syntax, if you said drama or comedy or, and you had a list of all those, the Lucene parser can generate a Boolean query on all that, but it's assuming you want scores for those values, so it's actually doing a, um, a, a scoring walk, basically. This guy's generating a more efficient filter, 
So this is an example of where the parser choice can make a more efficient query out of it. Um, in other cases, it will absolutely be less efficient. But again, like if you look at the example we had here, right, building that filter that, or building the filter version of that um, that you can cache might make this overall query more efficient too. So that's all the time we've got, everybody. Uh, there'll be another talk in here in 10 minutes. Check out the agenda, and I'll be outside if people have more questions. Thank you.